you know, just slowly pulling the fine control rod in small increments and so on until Jeremy could see on the chart the reactivity was just going up and up and up slowly. Everybody was quiet and listening, but he watched the, the gauges going up. And then he finally says, uh, put zip in. That's the control rod, a safety rod. And when that goes in, then the intensity drops. And that's, that was the proof that we had control and it went down again, all right? Until it stops, you know, <laughs> you're really not home for sure, all right? The experiment was recorded on the graph of a galvanometer, the birth certificate of the nuclear age. It established that a self-sustaining nuclear reaction was possible and that it could be controlled. What was accomplished in the next two years is astounding. Along the remote stretch of the Columbia River at Hanford, in the state of Washington, the data from Fermi's experiment was used to build three nuclear reactors to produce plutonium for an atom bomb. In Los Alamos, New Mexico, physicist Robert Oppenheimer and his team constructed the bomb. Two and a half years after Fermi's experiment in Chicago, it was ready to be tested. July 16, 1945. The Alamogordo Desert. The use of atomic energy for war was clearly demonstrated. One month later, two atomic bombs were dropped on Japan. The world's first look at the power of the atom was horrifying. The images of the destruction of the Japanese cities would serve to foster a fear of anything nuclear and a disbelief that something this destructive could ever truly be controlled for peace. After the war, those who worked with Fermi gathered for a reunion photograph at the University of Chicago. While many of the scientists had gone on to build the bombs, others stayed behind, working for peace. Albert Wattenberg, Walter Zinn, Bob Nobles, joined their efforts in a new government laboratory called Argonne National Laboratory. Of course, we at Argonne, uh, we dreamed of nuclear power. This will be a great peacetime gift to the world, uh, and I think it really, really was. They had a tremendous assignment to take the same power that had exploded the bomb and use it to make electricity. It was dangerous work. They needed to be in a remote part of the world. And so they chose a site of 400,000 unpopulated acres in southeastern Idaho. Over 40 years, they would build 52 different reactors. This was the first one. Today, it is open to the public as a national landmark. I think that this was the first one, and someone had to build this from scratch. Yes. Who was that? The spark plug was Walter Zinn. Uh, he, he was had part of the Manhattan Project. We see him in pictures with Enrico Fermi at the University of Chicago. That's correct. And, and he took the, uh, the peaceful side of the road he made some really good judgment calls in the kinds of reactors that he thought might be useful commercially. Walter Zinn would never become a familiar name like Fermi or Oppenheimer, but he was the father of peacetime nuclear energy. And in 1949, he led a team of young scientists who were to be responsible for harnessing the power of the atom. No one had ever built a nuclear power plant before, 
But Zinn knew that they would generate electricity in the same way that coal plants did, making heat to boil water, to make steam, to turn a turbine that drives a generator that produces an electric current. In a nuclear plant, the heat would come from the fissioning of uranium atoms in the chain reaction. It was promised to be clean, inexpensive, and limitless. John West worked with Zinn for 35 years. We were going to revolutionize the world. It was sort of a religion. And I can tell you in all sincerity that working in the nuclear power development was a lot more than a job. Always has been because we were going to do great things. There are all kinds of ways to build a nuclear reactor. But Zinn was captivated by an idea he and Fermi had discussed years before to construct a special kind of reactor that would burn fuel and create fuel at the same time. They called it a breeder reactor. To understand why a breeder is special, it's important to know that there are two kinds of uranium. In conventional nuclear plants, uranium-235 can be split and used to make energy. Uranium-238 cannot and is discarded as waste. But in a breeder reactor, High-energy, fast neutrons make something useless into something useful by changing uranium-238 into plutonium, which can be used to make energy, enabling a fast breeder reactor to create its own fuel. It would become a controversial idea, one that Charles Till has complete faith in. The thing that so captured the imagination of the pioneers was that in that way you could have essentially infinite amounts of energy from relatively limited stocks of uranium. It was endless? It was endless. It, was, it, it, it can be an endless supply of energy. And uh, it's as true today as it was then. It took two years to build, and on December 1st, 1951, nine years after Fermi's experiment in Chicago, Zinn's experimental breeder reactor became the first nuclear plant to produce electricity. It showed that unlimited power was possible. From this idea, more than 30 years later, would come the reactor that Dr. Till's team would declare was an important answer to the world's energy problems. Now we're going right on into the reactor floor. So this is where the fuel rods go down. That's the actual control rod mechanisms that operate the reactor. Oh. In that you take the subassembly. Till calls his reactor the integral fast reactor, the IFR. Like Walter Zinn's experimental reactor, it is a breeder. Argonne estimates that IFR technology could power the U.S. for 500 years with just the uranium that has already been mined. The unique thing about this kind of reactor is that you can, in fact, do what we're doing. Come inside the containment, walk around, do maintenance with the reactor in full operation. And no, uh, no radiation? No radiation whatsoever. Wow. No. Safe as your own home. To get from Walter Zinn's experimental reactor to Charles Till's integral fast reactor, Argonne scientists had to answer three concerns. Safety, nuclear waste, and fear that its plutonium could be used for weapons. It would take them more than 30 years working alone in the desert while the world around them was changing. In the early 50s, the Cold War between the United States and the Soviet Union was escalating. This rubble-strewn area is typical of what might happen to any of America's big cities if an atom bomb should fall. In an all-out mobilization of its civil defense forces, New York City goes on the alert following a simulated atomic attack. And across the world in Japan, America's stronghold in the Pacific, the busy commies were at it again. But far more sinister to Americans was home front communism. From their ranks will come the saboteurs, spies, and subversives 
should World War III be forced upon America. As the nuclear arms race between the superpowers began to build, President Dwight Eisenhower made an attempt to change its course. In 1953 at the United Nations, he proposed that the world work together to use atoms not for war, but for peace. The United States pledges before you to devote its entire heart and mind to find the way by which the miraculous inventiveness of man shall not be dedicated to his death, but consecrated to his life. From Eisenhower's plea for peace came all kinds of ideas. The touch of a button and seven and a half million cubic yards of Nevada desert are blown skywards. This nuclear test explosion is a graphic illustration of the power of the atom for peace. Scientists envision the day when the atom can be used to dig canals and harbors at one-twentieth the cost of conventional methods. But it was in the field of medicine that many saw the atom's greatest potential. At the Argonne Cancer Research Hospital, scientists began working with radioactive elements called isotopes in the treatment of cancer. Dr. Sean Mullen worked with those who attempted to destroy tumors with an isotope called strontium. Strontium is a long-lasting isotope which produces um, yttrium. It's the yttrium that does the damage. But essentially, this was a, a modified, minuscule nuclear reactor. The idea was to deliver the radioactive material directly to a tumor which would destroy the cancer cells. And for years, scientists would work on developing different ways to deliver the blow. Meanwhile, in Idaho, the scientists at Argonne pressed on with the job of creating nuclear power, taking risks to learn the limits of their science. Experiments with a boiling water reactor in 1954 were documented on film. It was not a breeder reactor, but a special design where water boiled right in the core to produce steam. To make a reactor safe, they needed to know at what point it would explode. And the only way to learn that was to push the reactor to the destruction point. They slowly increased the nuclear chain reaction until they saw what they needed to see. It went just as it was planned. The reactor was destroyed by a steam explosion, not a nuclear blast. And from experiments like this, the scientists were able to establish safety parameters. Progress was steady. The next year, another boiling water reactor was constructed. The lessons of the past were put to work. After a series of checks of instrument and servo controls, then the time comes for a test at full power. As the reactor began operating, it was clear that this reactor could power a small town. They chose a town 20 miles away, Arco. Here was the chance to make one more small slice of history. Arco, Idaho could be the first American town to be lighted experimentally and exclusively by nuclear power. It was July 17th, 1955, after dinner time. In town, the lights are still bright. Then, the substation cuts off conventional power and feeds in borax nuclear power. Marco sees new light. The story was carried around the world. Proof that electricity by nuclear energy was a reality. And today, the small town of Arco is still proud of its moment in history. But scientists learn as much from their mistakes as from their successes. And in 1955, a new term entered our vocabulary, meltdown. What would later evoke fears of a hole burning to China was first seen with no particular alarm at Walter Zinn's experimental breeder reactor. It happened while the scientists